Well, we are in the close of Hebrews, and we have been since chapter 11, and uh, we're in chapter 12 right now. And I promise you, he's actually closing it today, but we'll still have two more weeks after that. I'll explain that in a second. But he spent, gosh, he spent like from chapter 1 all the way up through chapter 10 making his case for the fact that we are actually citizens of a new city, of another place, of the fruition of a promise that God makes to us. And he makes that case all the way through the first 10 chapters. And then in 11, he gives us examples of people who actually live their lives now with the promise of a better life later and how much they sacrifice. Because, and, and in their faith, in their faith they, they put their trust in God's promise for life with him later. And as a result, sacrifice now. So that was his beginning of his end. He says, these, these are people you need to emulate. And then he gets into chapter 12, which is where we are now. And he really does bring it to close. But today he brings it to close, close, close. I mean, really, this is the end of his argument. In a really fascinating way. It's just really very unusual. But, uh, but it gives you an insight into the contrast between the Old Covenant, like Moses' laws, and the New Covenant, which is the promise of that. He gives us a contrast into that that it's not, it's not done like this anywhere else in the entire Bible. So that's why I'm excited about this, because this is new territory for a lot of us. Okay, so I put this picture up. This is a picture of uh, a volcano in Ecuador. How do you say that with a Spanish accent? Is it... Tungurawa? Tungurawa? I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's Foreign Language Sunday. Can you tell? What do you think? Tungurawa. Tungurawa? Okay, I'll go for that. Anyway, this was, uh, this was back in 2011. Uh, this, this incredible volcano was going off, and they took these pictures at night. This is a picture, actually, that's exposed just by the light of the lava coming down the side of the mountains. So it was, at, at night, it was just spectacular. I mean, it looked like Lord of the Rings Plus. And so uh, we need to use this picture. I, I think I've got a close-up picture right here. Oh, there we are. Uh, because this is really what he's going to say is what the new covenant looks like. Ah, the old covenant, the old covenant, not the new, but the old covenant from Mount Sinai. So he's going to use this image, which is very familiar with Jews who are the, the readers of his book. Because when the... You know, when the Ten Commandments were given, they were given at the top of a mountain. But what we forget is what was going on in the mountain at the time this was all going on. It was spooky, scary. So I'll just take you back for a second. Exodus 19, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, and you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, take care, you do not go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death because the Lord's coming down this mountain. So he says, don't come close. You can't come close to me. And it was a terrifying scene. He says in Exodus 19, 16, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet that was going on, a trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. It was like this, but probably worse. Okay. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. I mean, imagine being at the base of something like this. I, just terrifying. And then in verse, verse 18 of chapter 20, he says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and they trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. I mean, that's how in terrifying this entire scene was. Now, between chapter 19 and chapter 20, actually a few verses before this verse right here, you know what happened? The Ten Commandments are given. <laughs> in the midst of all this, the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments are given up there as well as a lot of other Ten Commandment-oriented laws that God gives, and, and God is speaking to Moses about this. Moses is at the top of this disaster. He's at the top of this, and he was there for more than a month. So he's up there and God's telling him about the laws, about how things are going to run. The actual tablets, like we see in that picture there, being held by Charlton Heston. Can't see him, but he's there behind there. That's his hands. The, the actual Ten Commandment tablets don't come down for another dozen chapters in Exodus. But the giving of this law is happening while this is going on. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So what God is trying to say in a very visible, very dramatic way is I'm giving you the law 
uh, around which your new society, now that you're out of Egypt, your new society will run around this law. And it'll be good for you if you do this law. And if you do not do this law, there's judgment coming. And so he decided to couch the entire giving of the law, which is for their good, in this vision of tremendous disaster and wrath and destruction. Now, this is, this is God being very dramatic, <laughs> uh, almost theatrical di- dramatic. I mean, he's doing this on purpose. He wants to make a point. And then people get the point because they say at the bottom right there, they say, look, we want you to speak to us because if God directly speaks to us, we're all going to die. Now, why would they feel that? Well, because God is a holy God. He's a just God. He's a God that is aiming toward judgment for all mankind. And if that is indeed the case, which of us can stand? So they understand this. And the, and the whole volcanic you know, lightning, thunder, trumpets, clouds, the whole night, the, 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 the night show of this great wrath of God sobers them up about maybe we ought to do this law. <laughs> now, you got to remember, when they left Egypt, they were living according to Egyptian law. I mean, they were a nation, but they're only a nation kind of ethnically speaking while they're in Egypt. They didn't, they didn't really self-govern. They were actually slaves, so Egypt did that. So when they came out of that and they're in the desert, which is where the Ten Commandments come, they're out in the desert, God is saying, I'm going to establish you as a nation. And oh, by the way, and we talked about this last week, I will be your king. I will be the leader of your nation. You're not going to have a pharaoh lookalike. I'm going to be the one that does this. So if that's the case, if you're going to live in my kingdom, in my land that I promised to you over there, if you're going to live there, let me tell you how it is as citizens you need to live. Don't steal from each other. One of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, Don't lust after each other's property. Don't lust after your neighbor's wife. I mean, don't, don't do all this kind of stuff. If you, if you restrain yourself like this and you do these other things, things will go well. You need to respect me as the king. That's honor God above everyone else. I mean, you need, you need to do all of this stuff. Things will go well here in this society if we follow these rules. If you don't follow these rules, I'll bring judgment because you're actually bringing harm to the people in this community, which are the people that I love, and I'm their king. So he was, he was really straight up about, about sin and all that kind of stuff. In fact, this is sort of what the Old Covenant specializes in. If you're going to do a summary of the Old Covenant, it specializes in the giving of the law, which is actually a statement of righteousness living in God's kingdom. I mean, I mean, very simple things that we largely agree with intuitively. Like, you know, life will be better if you just stop stealing from each other. <laughs> That's where I want to live. <laughs> so he, he lays these things down, and he defines basically righteousness living in the kingdom of God, what that looks like in you and I, you know, how we live. <clears throat> but he knows that there's going to be a problem with us doing it, so he also pays a lot of attention, God pays a lot of attention to sin and the rebellion of sin and the getting around these laws and a lot of the narrative you see in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel, in Exodus especially, and in Joshua, you see them not really doing the law. They, they do other things. Like, for instance, part of this time that God is giving this law at the top of, of Mount Sinai, Moses is up there and he's getting ready to come down with, you know, the Charlton Heston granite slabs. He's getting, he's getting ready to come down, and God tells him, oh, there's bad, bad stuff going on at the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> and so he comes down, and he finds that the people thought, well, you know, you were up there a really long time, Moses, and so we thought, you know, God had abandoned us, and he'd killed you, because, hey, look at the mountain, you know? So we decided we needed to make for ourselves a substitute God, a substitute God. So we collected all of our earrings, melted down all the gold, and we threw them in a fire. And to quote, <laughs> to quote Aaron directly, he says, we threw them in a fire and out came a calf. <coughs> I mean, you didn't fashion it? Well, no, we threw them in the fire and it came out a calf. And they had the golden calf incident. And they're actually, they're actually worshiping a golden calf at the bottom of the mountain while Moses is coming down with the Ten Commandments. Live like this and you'll find peace. Well, it doesn't turn out well. <laughs> So actually, a lot of the narrative about the Old Testament with the nation of Israel is that although they have the law and they know what it takes to be righteous, they cannot do it. They cannot do it. They sin, they rebel, and so God speaks a lot about judgment and about wrath because they've disobeyed the king in charge of the kingdom. Now, it seems very severe to us. <laughs> it seems like, wow, that's, uh, that's bad news. However, the deal is, is even in the New Testament perspective, there is good news, but it's in contrast to the bad news. And the bad news, Roman 3, all of sin, fallen short of the glory of God. And so where are you headed at that point? Judgment and wrath. Oh, it's something we don't talk about a lot in church. We'd rather kind of major on the loving God and minor on 
the justice God. I mean, but to be fair, when Jesus and John the Baptist started their verbal ministries in the area, you remember what their, what their first message was? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. It's all about the issue of sin. Okay, so this is what the Old Testament majors on. And in fact, when Paul comments on the Old Covenant in the New Testament, he says, you know, what good was the law? If we can't do it, what, what, what's the good of it? I mean, all, all it does is condemn us. It just condemns us. It tells us how far short we are. And he says, that's the genius of it. The law tells us that although we think of ourselves as largely good people, we are actually not. We are actually riddled with sin. And that's what the law does. The law reveals the nature of the rebellion in your heart. Unfortunately, as human beings, you're born with this. <laughs> now, you don't acquire this. You're born with this. Uh, even my youngest children, before I could teach them how to be rebellious, were rebellious. So we're born with this, this it's kind of like a tragic flaw in humanity that came from Adam and Eve. We will sin. We will sin. So the, the issue is, is that how do you rectify this problem of sin, which is, which is a pandemic throughout history and all humanity? How do you deal with this? And because here's God who's saying, I brought you out of Egypt. I promised you a great land flowing with milk and honey. Everything is really cool. I've laid out all the plans, but you guys are not obeying. You guys are not being citizens. You are not trusting and loving me. I mean, how are we going to deal with this? And that's the tension of the entire Bible. How do you deal with that? Because you have a God who wants you to be in his midst for the blessing of it. But we have a God who says, but I can't have you in my midst because of your sin. Uh, you see that when you see them camping in the desert in Exodus. God says, we're going to go out in the desert. Everyone set up your tents. We know three tribes this way, three tribes this way, three tribes this way, three tribes this way. And right in the center of all the tribes is my tent. God says, I will dwell in your midst. That's the tabernacle. It's the tent place where God lives. I will dwell in your midst, but you can't come near only one person can come inside my tent once a year. You can't come near, but I want to be in your midst. So this is the tension you have throughout the entire Bible. A God, a creator God, who wants us to be blessed by his presence, a rebellious and sinful humanity that stiff arms God, but God still persists in wanting us to be in his presence. How do you solve the problem? That's the tension of the entire Bible. Now, when you read the Old Testament, there are these tremendous hints about the fact that there is one coming who will be instrumental in fixing that tension. This Messiah, this one who will come. Isaiah 53, that all of our iniquities will be put on him, will be put on him. And somehow there will be a change happening because of the fact that he will bear the wrath of God on our behalf. So this is, this is not just hinted at, it's said very explicitly in many places in the Old Testament. So the Jews throughout all their history in the Old Testament, they look for it and say, well, someday God will, God will fix the problem with us making golden calves all the time. God will fix something about our rebellion. He'll somehow fix the way so that the promises of being in his land with him will work. And so again, of course, you know, the fulfillment of those promises of the Messiah was Jesus. So that's, that's the overview of the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant idea. The Old Covenant largely existed to highlight the problem of sin and to make really well known the consequences of it. And that's why when God gave the law, he gave it on top of a flaming mountain. <laughs> oh, so he's going to work on this in this passage today. Okay, so let's get into today's passage. That was all just review. <clears throat> so the question we have, is, since he's been talking about New Covenant all through Hebrews, is what have we come to in the New Covenant? Okay, what have we come to? What have we arrived at? So this is why this is a conclusion statement. I've talked about the New Covenant. I've talked about the Messiah. So what exactly is the life we've come to in the New Covenant? That's his question that he's going to answer. And so he starts it off with this by the contrast we just looked at. So we're in chapter 12, verse 18. And this is his contrast. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet ooh, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg, beg that no further messages be spoken to them. Huh? We just read that. You haven't come to this in the new covenant. This is not the new covenant. That's not what you've come to in the new covenant. That's what you've come to in an old covenant when we talked about sin. No. <clears throat> Going back to that image, you know, they could not endure the order that was given. Even a simple one, like if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. So here's God's in their, God's in their presence at the top of this mountain. But he says, don't you even start to come up this mountain. Don't you even come close. If you come close, you, you have to kill whatever's come close. 
Like, this is the holiness of God. This is the separation of God. They couldn't even do that, he says. And also, he says, indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses, Moses said, I tremble with fear. <laughs> and again, he was up at the top of that mountain for 40 days. He was in the midst of that crazy lava, firestorm, trumpet, scary, something that is so terrifying that at the base of the mountain, people kept backing off. And God asked Moses to come up to the top. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, 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 I'm sure. And he came up and gave him the law. So this is the old covenant. This is not what you've come to in the new covenant. That's what you came to in the old covenant, highlighting the problem of sin. Okay, well, what have we come to in the new covenant? It's one of my favorite pictures. There's a hillside village in France called Gordes. It's, uh, it's uh, north of Marseille. Marseille is on the French Riviera. You come inland just a little bit. There's these nice rolling hills. And for eons, they have built these gorgeous little villages perched on the edge of these hillsides. I mean, it's just idyllic. So what have we come to? Have we come to a mountain that's on fire? He says, well, we have come to a mountain, but we've come to a different mountain. In the new covenant, that's the contrast. In the new covenant. And he says in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. He says, you have come to a mountain, and that implies separatedness from the world. Mountains were always holy places because they were kind of separated. But that mountain you've come to is not one where God fumes and the wrath of God is visible and the fire and the thunder and the trumpets. What you've come to is a place that God has invited you to live on, and it's the, it's the city of the living God. It's where he reigns, where he is. And in other words, it's called the heavenly Jerusalem. You know, when you read about the heavenly Jerusalem and you get into Revelation, hey, it's a city. <laughs> and so this is what he's saying. The, the most stark contrast he could make between the old covenant, which highlights sin, and the new covenant, which highlights forgiveness and grace and, and all that goes in that package. The best way I can do that is he says, you have the one mountain that fumes with justice and you have the other mountain that invites you to live in the presence of God. Because that was always the destination, was to live in the presence of God. That's the mountain you've been called to in the new covenant. So don't get hung up on the old covenant. The old covenant existed for a time and it was valid and it was necessary, but he says all it did was highlight sin. Now that Christ has come, we have a solution to sin and now we can participate in the big promise, which is the city of the living God, where God is. I mean, that's, that's the good news. And so even this picture at Gordes French is kind of like a slight, <laughs> it's only a slight inference of what it's going to be in terms of how great it is. God has called you into a community uh, that is redeemed by his son's blood, that is full of people who've been transformed by the power of his spirit. He's, he's brought you to a place where he himself lives. He, he lives in our midst and he invites us to live in his midst. This is the promise. This is the promise that threaded all the way from Abraham up into the present. That's what he's saying. That's what you've been called to right there. Now, th this, is a, this is a necessary contrast to the Jewish readers. Because to the Jewish readers, every time you would mention God, they would see a lava mountain. Because <laughs> they would remember it. God, God is powerful on our behalf. He did split the Red Sea and stuff like that. But hey, we are in tents in the desert. And, and Moses went up there and there was this gigantic mountain and there was all these flaming and thunder and scary stuff. And we were just terrified of what was going to happen. And even as life went on in the desert and then into Joshua took him into the promised land, even through all that stuff, when things went bad, God judged it. I mean, there is a scene where God opened up the ground and swallowed a whole bunch of people. So, so when you mentioned God to a Jew, they would in instantly think about the God who is unremitting when it comes to sin. He is serious about sin. He is serious about sin. And if indeed sin is meant uh, to destroy us from Satan's perspective, then God, if he's loving, which he is, will be will be unwavering when it comes to sin. I do not want you involved in this stuff because this stuff will kill you. It'll kill you. Why would God, if he loves us, take a blind eye toward our participation in sin? That doesn't make any sense at all. It's like dabbling in, dabbling in cancer. And he says, oh, that's okay. You can play with that. I don't care. No. Hmm. no. Here's a God who loves us tremendously and, and does not want us to be destroyed by sin. Because after all, the wages of sin is death. Now, just, a, just a brief pause in this whole discussion. There is, in my mind over the years, I've 
my thinking about people who, who uh, actively embrace sin has really changed over time. Not because the sin itself is now right, uh, because it's allowed in the culture, but more because of the fact that to the degree to which the people that I know and I'm acquainted with and that I meet and who I fall in love with, why would I take a compromise view when it comes to sin? Now, I, I, can't, I can't beat them over a stick and say, stop doing that, although that's what I want to do. <laughs> but I am, I am quite straightforward about saying, you know, if you ask my opinion of this, I got to let you know, biblically, what you're involved in is death. It's, it's death. That's something that we don't like to say in our culture because in our culture we like to think, you know, we can be open to new ideas and open to new kinds of things and that we progress into new human beings as we evolve into enlightenment and all this kind of stuff. But in the end, sin is sin and sin will always self-destroy people. So, um, just and just one quick aside, when I was in college, um, uh, I, I was in a two-room apartment two-bedroom apartment, with, so there's four of us in this apartment, and I roomed in my room with two beds with a guy who was, was uh, gay, was very gay, loved him to death, just a neat, neat guy, Christian, gay, and uh, from time to time, he would slip uh, sexually, he'd go off to the bathhouses in Sacramento, get up, you know, just get involved and come back, just feel horrible, and we talked a lot, I mean, we talked a lot, and I said, I said, look, Bob, you know, here, here's the deal, I can't hit you with a stick <laughs> to get you to not do this, but I, I do want to tell you that biblically, I think you're involved in something that will that will that is toxic to your soul. I, I think it'll eat away at you. And he would say, I know, I know, because I experience this every time I fall and every time I'm out for the night and I come back at three in the morning, every time I do this, I come back feeling like I lost part of who I am. I said, yeah, like that, like that. And so we would constantly have these discussions about the, the turmoil he was in because of his homosexuality. It was a really hard thing for him, and it was a hard thing for me. But we can't go around beating people with sticks, but we can, in a loving and compassionate way, say, if you want my advice on this, I can tell you biblically that God's saying that this will cause creeping death in your life. So that's where I come from these days. Compassionately, because I'm, a, I'm, I'm more and more struck with the with the refuse that sin leaves in people's lives, that I can't not talk. But I also need to be respectful in how I do it. So anyway, we could go a lot into that, but I won't go there now. But anyway, okay. So what have we come to? Well, now he, he uh, enumerates for us who's going to be there. <laughs> I think if anyone asks you what heaven is like, what the city of God is going to be like, you can, you can make this list right here. So first off, he says, what we've come to in this city of God, we've come to innumerable angels in festal gathering. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, innumerable means we're talking about the host of heaven. You know, all, all the powers, all the angels, where, you know, we know biblically that a single angel can destroy all of Jerusalem because David had that experience, you know, with the threat of that. So we're talking about these angels who are, um, without question, extraordinarily powerful. But they're coming, the host of heaven are coming, and they're all going to be decked out in party clothes. They're going to be celebrating. That's the festal. That's the festal gathering. They are there not to, to do spiritual battle, which is what our experience right now is. They are there to celebrate. They're there to celebrate. The entire host of heaven is going to come down and celebrate. The closest inkling do we have of what that's going to be like is the night that Jesus was born. Remember that the shepherds are out there and when they're with the sheep, ah, right, and they're out there, and all of a sudden heaven opens up with one angel, Totally freaks them out, right? Totally freaks them out. And then the shepherds, as they're drawing back this one angel in the middle of the night, then suddenly it's like someone draws back a curtain, and the sky is full of these angels. Now, that, that's when you freak out. <laughs> but when you see the angels show up, they're not there to bring judgment or power to destroy anything. They are there to celebrate. Glory to God in the highest. Woo! That's, that's just an inkling of what it's going to be like here. So when you come to the city of God, don't be freaked out if you happen to see a lot of angels that are partying because they're excited. Okay? They are excited. What else? And what else do we come to? Well, we come to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. That's you. Wait, are you a firstborn? Well, you know, we've talked about the firstborn thing before. The firstborn in a family anciently is one 
is the, the child in the family who supremely represents the will of the father and carries on the will of the father because he's the firstborn. So what you and I are when he talks about this is you and I are people who have put aside our will and have adopted the will of the father totally, right? That, that's what he's talking about. That's us. The assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Did you know your name is written someplace? When Jesus sent out his disciples to go, you know, cast out some demons and all that kind of stuff, they came back all jacked about the fact, hey, we went out there and we told those demons get out and they came out. Can you believe that? Woo! They were excited. And remember what Jesus says? Chill. Well, he doesn't say chill. He says, he says calm down. If you want to be excited about anything, be excited that your names are written in heaven. Is that right there? If you want to celebrate something, celebrate that. Because the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, your name has been written and enrolled in heaven. You. Wow. Wow. It's almost as though when you come to this place in the city of God, when you come to enter into it, it's as though like when you, you know when you go to a, a big affair and you come in the front door and they say, name please, and you give them your name, and then they check the list to see if you've been invited. Oh yeah, you have been invited by name. There you are. Not by anything you've done, but because of what Christ has done for us. We've been invited. <clears throat> well, it's not just going to be you. It's going to be all of us. And anyone you've ever known who's passed away who, is, who loved the Lord. I, I like all over again. It's going to be like, uh, like Dorothy and I were talking about a few weeks ago when we were in Spokane. It'll be, like, it'll be like a high school reunion, but like a thousand times better. I mean, you'll see people you haven't seen for a long time. You'll see those who love the Lord tremendously. You'll see all of them celebrated by all the angels having this party over your heads and all the people that you love and who love God. That's, wow. Who else will be there? Well, that's not the whole list. God will be there. Whoa. But now, I would not have written it like that. It almost sounds like a killjoy kind of comment. God will be there, the judge of all. <laughs> uh, uh. All that really means at that point is this God who loves you and who has invited you here and who has paid the price for you to be at this city of God is also the one who in his unremitting justice has made sure that the sheep and goats have been perfectly separated. The judge of all. And now that's, it, it sounds like a threatening thing in a way because I'm thinking, gosh, if I get there and I think about all the sin that I've done in my life and I think, you know, so he's invited me here, but you know, I'm not really sure um, I'm worthy of this because I can think of a handful of times where I was evil well, not a handful of times. Let's say a boatload of times I was evil. Oh, no, let's say a whole lifetime of time that I was evil. I can think of all that kind of stuff, and I'm, and I'm thinking, maybe I'm sort of out of place here. Maybe, you know, maybe I don't deserve to be here. I mean, I see other people here uh, who are much more godly than me, and I'm not sure. Well, stop that. Just stop all that kind of stuff. The judge of heaven, God himself, has looked at you and said, come on in. Come on in. And it's an amazing thing because it has nothing to do with our history with sin. It has everything to do with his solution to our history and sin. What Jesus has done. Who else is there? Wow, this is cool. To the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Who is that? <laughs> well, that's us again, by the way. But it's actually, a, it's a better description of the people who passed on before us, right? But, um, but he says the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Well, that perfect word we know, we've talked about this before. The perfect word doesn't mean, you know, like perfect, like I don't have any sin anymore, although that's actually part of it. That perfect word really means the end, a completed process to get you to the end of what God intended for you. So what he's saying, basically, that the spirits of the righteous have finally completed the plan. They finally got to the end of the plan. For you and I, you will indeed get to the end of the plan God has for you. And then when we're in the city of God, you can say, well, God finished it. We finished it. I, I got nothing else to do. <laughs> he finished it. And in fact, when, when you read in Acts, you get a lot of sermons in Acts when the, the gospel is going to different places around Turkey and stuff like that. There's one case where Paul is speaking and he's speaking and he has the throwaway line that he makes where he's, as he's recounting the history of, of Israel, he gets to King David. And he's talking about David in a wonderful way. But then this phrase he sticks in is, when David had completed his tasks in his generation, God took him home. I mean, the way it's written, it sounds like, it sounds like 
you've got a list of tasks for you, your name's at the top, and uh, you start here, and you go to the bottom, and when you get to the last thing on the list, God says, well, that's it. You've completed your task in your generation. Psst, come on home. Is it that delineated? It is. It is. And when you get to the end of the list, that's when you get to that perfect word, telos. You've finished the course. You got to the end. There's, you're done. You're done. For you, God had a plan for your life from the very beginning when you were born. <laughs> got done. You're in the city of God. That's just an incredible thing. To the spirits of the righteous, completed is how I always translate that. Okay, what else? Well, look to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Whew, good. <laughs> because, because the tension with God, the judge of all, made me a little tense until I saw, oh, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. The new covenant is the fulfillment of this city of God, is this living in the midst of God. And, and so how is that possible? Well, we know he talked about it for the first 10 chapters of Hebrews. And it's talked about all through the rest of the New Testament. How are we who are so stained by sin allowed to come into the presence of God and be invited into the city of God because of Jesus? Jesus was the mediator. That is, he was the guy who did the task where he had one foot in humanity and he had one foot in the throne room of God because he is God and man simultaneously because he's that intermediary, he can not only identify with our weaknesses and the things that we deal with, he told us that before, but he's also our high priest, which means high priest terms Jewish sense is someone who comes into the presence of God on our behalf for our benefit. So Jesus is the mediator. He's the one that has made this entire thing possible, okay? He's the one that makes this party uh, doable from our perspective. And then here's his last thing. This is a fascinating thing. To the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's the last thing on his list. Well, he's speaking Jewish here. So you got to understand a little bit of the Jewish stuff here, right? You remember Cain and Abel? And, and, and remember Abel got killed by Cain? A little jealousy going on there? Do you remember there was a specific phrase at that time when Cain was trying to hide what he did and God says to him, yes, but the blood of Abel speaks to me from the ground. The blood of Abel figuratively speaking, is condemning Cain. The blood is condemning Cain. And so the blood of Abel actually spoke of condemnation to Cain. That, that's what he's talking about. And it's a very famous phrase in the Old Testament, starting from way back at the beginning of the Old Testament. You've got that. The blood of Abel spoke condemnation and wrath because of what Cain had done. But the blood of Jesus, does it speak condemnation and wrath like Abel's blood? No, 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 the blood of Jesus, that sprinkled blood, it speaks a much better word than condemnation and wrath from the blood of Abel. That's what he's saying. There is, there is a sense in which the Messiah, Jesus, died on our behalf, um, his blood flowed on our behalf, and because of that blood, uh, symbolically in the temple, that blood of the sacrifices were sprinkled on the people. Remember that? It was sprinkled on the people. And even the writer of Hebrews says, you almost might say that everything is cleansed by blood. That's what he says. Everything is cleansed by blood, and it's sprinkled everywhere. The tabernacle, the entirety of the tabernacle is sprinkled with blood. The way that goes into the holy place in the tabernacle is sprinkled with blood. The way from the holy place where there's the table of showbread and where's that lamp, and then goes up to the edge of the veil where there's a table that's got incense going, is sprinkled with blood. And then if you part the veil and go into the very presence of God, which you better not do, by the way, because you'll die. But if you part that veil and go in, which the high priest did, he would go into the center of the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, and he would bring blood with him. And as he came up to the Ark, he would sprinkle it with blood. This beautiful gold, gold-laid box that has the promises of God in the Ten Commandments, and it's got a, a bowl of men, and it's got Aaron's stick that butted. I mean, this, this incredible thing, and it's got these two solid gold angels on the top of it. Beautiful, solid gold, sprinkled with blood every single year. It was such a, such a stark contrast to see, to see this incredibly ornate ark that was so central to uh, what, testifying to God's promises to us, because it's the Ark of the Covenant, it's his promises. To see this incredibly beautiful, almost heavenly looking golden box, and it's completely besmirched by blood. 
And so you can say, actually, that the entire path from into the tabernacle, from the outside world, past the place where they sacrificed animals, into the first door, which is into the holies, and then pass that into the holy of holies, the entire pathway from sinful man into the presence of God is sprinkled with blood. Saying, he said earlier, if you remember Hebrews, he said, it's as though, it's as though Jesus is a forerunner for us. It's like he went ahead of us. And he, and he made a way for us to come into the very presence of God. And how? Paved with his blood. The picture is just extraordinary. That's why I was a little put off on Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember when they had the ark out there, you know, and they're getting ready to open it, very dramatic scene, you know, laser beams come out and, yeah, yeah, forget all that stuff. But what I was disappointed with is I wanted to see the front of that ark smattered with blood because if it was the ark, it would be a gold box splattered with blood with the constant reminder that coming into the presence of God, something or someone will have to die on behalf of your sins. And that's the only way into the presence of God. Wow. The sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel spoke out about the injustice of his murder, the condemnation of the sin of Cain. But the blood of Christ does not speak that. The blood of Christ does not speak out condemnation for us. It actually speaks out hope for us and payment for our sins. It says something remarkably better. That's what he's saying. That's what he's been trying to tell them all the way through the book of Hebrews. Blood, 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 Old Testament. Blood, 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 blood. Payment for your sins. You sin, you go into the tabernacle, you atone for that by killing something. Something must die in order to deal with your sin. The wrath of God will not be stopped. Something must die on your behalf. So when Christ comes and John the Baptist sees him, he declares to everyone there in a shorthand that every Jew would understand. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And to every Jew standing there, they're thinking, blood splattered, sins atoned for. I mean, the picture is just vibrant in their minds. He is the Lamb of God. He is the perfect Lamb sacrificed on our behalf. And with his blood, we find a pathway into the presence of God. I mean, the pictures of the tabernacle are great. Well, okay, so the sprinkled blood speaks a better word. What word does it speak? And he says, here's the word that the blood of Jesus speaks. And he goes on. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. He's talking about the blood still. Don't refuse the one who's speaking. And he's speaking through his blood. Jesus himself is speaking through his blood, saying, I've died for you. I've died so that you can have fellowship with God himself. Don't, don't. Don't ignore this. Don't refuse this. And you remember when he started the book of Hebrews, in chapter 2, he, he comes in after he talks about angels for a while. He gets into chapter 2 and he says, look, we need to talk about what Jesus has done as Messiah. We've got to steer away from the old covenant that you see in the tabernacle. We've got to talk about what Jesus has done. And that's what I'm going to do in this book. I'm going to talk about what Jesus has done on your behalf. It's different than the old covenant. But then he says a really scary statement. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And he's saying it again right here. How will we escape? This is the plan. And if you stiff arm this, there, there is no plan B. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? This is the word he's giving to the Jewish readers at the time who trusted in not only their ethnic background as Jews, but trusted in the fact that they had a temple, they could do sacrifices. You know, as long as I keep my account clean and I'm sacrificing on the lambs, I think I'll be okay. And he says, no, 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 you don't understand. A much greater sacrifice has been made and you will not escape if you neglect that salvation. And that's what he's saying here. See that it do, you do not refuse him who's speaking. For look, if, if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. So he's saying in the new covenant now, God indeed is inviting and drawing humanity to himself. But the first step in your motion toward him has got to start with repentance. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is here. You've got you to be upfront about the situation of your sin. And you have, to be, you have to be humbled to the point where you cry out to God and say, God, I am riddled with sin. It keeps me out of your presence. Is there a solution? Yes, the solution is in Christ himself. And you embrace that in solution. And then you're in the city of God. But if you, if you stiff arm that offer, there's no going back. There's no going back. That's what he's saying to his Jewish readers. 
You need to shift your paradigm to the sacrificed lamb, Jesus. So he recoups for us. You know, at that time, his voice shook the earth. It shook the earth. But now he has promised this. This should shake you to the core. <laughs> Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. So there is a time coming where there will be another shaking. And that's still to come. That's still to come. And when he talks about that, he says this phrase, yet once more, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, things that have been shaken already. That is, things that have been made <clears throat> in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So here's the scary part of it. A day is coming. It's actually on God's calendar, a specific day. That's why in the Old Testament they call it the day of the Lord. It's, it's, uh, it's there. Everyone wants a sneak peek at what day it's on, but he's not going to give us a sneak peek. But there's a day that's there. And he's saying right here, at that moment, God's going to like take up, you know, the blanket and give it a big shake. Boom. And what falls off, falls off. And what remains, remains. Woo. A great shaking is still to come. And so that's why he's really saying this after, look, my Jewish friends, don't ignore the Lamb of God who's Jesus. Don't ignore him because he is he is the solution to your sinfulness. And when the shaking comes, boom, the only thing that will remain are those who've repented of those sins, who've embraced God and his solution for us, and who've loved God with all their hearts. That's the only thing that will remain. And it'll be a real shaking. Yeah. And it's still to come. Therefore, Let's be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. <laughs> so what he has promised us in the city of God is a future that when he goes, boom, will not fall off. It'll not be shaken. It, it, it won't suffer that. Only the good things will remain when we get done here. So be thankful that you've been invited to a promised kingdom of God, a promised city of God that will not be shaken. No matter what happens, it will not go off the books. It is going to happen. And hasn't that been his message all the way through Hebrews? God has made a promise to you for life with him. Great promise of, of finding life in him. Isn't that true he's going to do that? Yeah, it is true. Well, then what happens when you come across bad times? What happens, you know, when your car breaks down? Or what happens when someone in your family dies? Or what happens when all manner of horrible things, horrible, fatal news of health? I mean, it's just so many things that can go wrong in this life. Are you, are, are you looking at those shortfalls in your expectations for life and saying, maybe that promise no longer exists. Maybe God's being mean to me, and if he's mean to me right now, then maybe this is not going to happen. Well, you're being very easily shaken. <laughs> Circumstances went woof, and we're often tempted to jettison the whole thing, including this. And this promise he's made about the city of God and your being in it is something that will not be shaken. So this is really practical for us as we live life and we are shaken by circumstances, is to say, well, I might be shaken by my circumstances, but that will never be shaken. And that promise will always be there. And that will always be there. That was, that was what all the, the, the people, the characters we see in Hebrews 11 did. They were going through horrible stuff. And, and, and he said, even of Abraham, Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees and to come to a place he'd never been before. He was expecting the city of God, and yet he died before the promises was fulfilled. Yeah, because it's there. It's not here. It's a beautiful word. We'll see it in chapter 13 when we get there next week. A beautiful word where he says, here, here, we do not have a lasting city. It'll be shaken and gone. Here, we do not have a lasting city. However, there, we do. So that's the shaking idea. He wants you to be serious about this. So as a result, as we anticipate that coming, he says, thus, you know, let's offer to God acceptable worship. Let's worship him with reverence and with awe. As you're citizens of that place, as you're declining citizens in this place, and you're not building cities here, but you're actually aiming towards there. As your citizenship kind of comes into full view as you go there, we slowly pull ourselves out of this place. We pull up our roots here, and we say, well, you know, even though tragedy strikes and everything's going bad in my life, that's just part of me kind of pulling up stakes here. But that will not be shaken. That will always be there. And so I will endure this, because that will never be shaken. 
However, <laughs> our God is a consuming fire. We, we don't say this very much to people. But this is the deal. Sin is a big deal. Sin is a very big deal. And in the same time, on the left of that, that screen, you see the wonderful city of God that's promised that cannot be shaken. It won't go away. The promise endures. Still, in the middle of the screen, you see that God has not changed. He still is unremitting when it comes to sin. And when the shaking happens, anything that embraces sin goes. Anything that embraces sin. Well, what about us? Well, if you've come to Christ, you've stopped embracing sin. You started embracing him. Yeah, but I still sin. I know, but isn't your response different now? I mean, isn't it when you do sin, you kind of kick the dirt and go, oh, man, did I do that? I hate that that's part of my life. I, I hate that. I don't want that to be who I am. That's not embracing sin. It is repenting of it and confessing it and coming clean with God and saying, God, I agree, that's just stinky stuff. And I hate the fact that it's still part of who I am, but I don't embrace it anymore. God, I want you to take that out. I want you to take that away from me. I want you to cleanse me from that. And that process where he slowly, one at a time for your instruction, starts pulling these sins out of your life is a way for you to be continually thankful about the fact that he sees your sin, he knows your sin, and he's in charge of eradicating it from your life. And that's one of the ways in which he disconnects you from here is by doing that. And if he'd done it all overnight, <laughs> you wake up the next morning just totally whacked out. Like, oh, what happened? He does it slowly. And, and, and for many of us, it's just like, it's frustrating. God, I, I, want, I want this part of who I am not to be a part of who I am anymore. However, however, there are people who to their very dying days will embrace sin and what they do because they think somehow it brings life to the very end. And God says, those people are different. <laughs> They don't condemn their own sin and are sorry and grieving over their own sin. They actually promote it and depend upon it. That's the two camps. That's the sheep and goats camp. Our God is a consuming fire. Okay, if you think that's harsh, let me remind you of some New Testament passages. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it's in the New Testament. It's not just about fuzzy grace. Luke 3, 16. This is John the Baptist. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who's mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Why? Because he's the judge. He's the judge. He has an unremitting attitude towards sin. He doesn't look at our sin and say, well, that's okay. No, in fact, he endures the wrath of God on our behalf for those. This is deadly serious kind of stuff. The Holy Spirit and fire. Now this fire part of Jesus' role is judgment that is still to come. However, he does convict us of sin through his Holy Spirit. I mean, there's a lot that happens with us kind of rooting out sin from here to there. But when we talk about Jesus baptizing us with fire, you have, to, you have to get the general sense of what the word baptism means to realize how terrifying this is. Because baptism means to be placed into something over your head. It, means to be placed, it just means to be placed into something. Is what baptism means in its general sense. So he's saying that there's a time coming that for many, they will be placed in over their head into fire. And that's not just a little singeing, that's utter destruction. This is, you know, meek and mild Jesus. <clears throat> That's who John's talking about. Well, let's see what Jesus says. Jesus says, Matthew 13, 39, the harvest is the end of the age. That's that thing over there. And the reapers are angels. And just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire in a harvest, so will it be at the end of the age. Oh, yeah, I, I do remember him saying that, but I kind of went past that because it seemed a little too severe. Because I like the loving Jesus. I don't like the judging Jesus. Hmm. Well... It's everywhere. John 15. If anyone does not abide in me, that means you actually live in Jesus. You, you find your dwelling place in Jesus. Anyone who does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. That, that seems a little harsh. <laughs> However, it's consistent with the message of the Old Testament. We have a God who is simultaneously just, unremitting with sin, 
and we have a God who's loving and gracious. And then the way you bring yourself into his presence when he's both of those things is by the mediator, Jesus, and then blood sprinkled on our behalf. But just because his grace has been, has been given to you, it doesn't mean that we need to take a soft attitude on sin because Jesus doesn't take a soft attitude on sin. We shouldn't take a soft attitude on sin because it's destroying people around us. And it's destroying us. And so all those things, all of those things that embrace and are connected with sin, that, that actually promote it and use it, those things whew, will all be burned. They'll all be burned. Yikes. If you think that's a downer, <laughs> remember we saw the mountain with the flames at the top, right? Remember that? I remember the people were so freaked out about that at the bottom. They said, Moses, 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 you tell us what we're supposed to do. Don't make God tell us because if he tells us, we're all going to die. Well, you got the message then. Yes, you got the message then. Well, actually, just a few verses later, in fact, a few verses after the golden calf incident where they make their own God at the bottom of the mountain because they think Moses and God killed each other or something. I don't know what it is. It says this, because, because when God establishes his covenant with the nation of Israel, post-golden calf, what, what you would think is a totally unforgivable sin, when you look at this passage in Exodus, after the golden calf, God says, I'm going to make a contract with Israel. Okay, here's my contract with Israel. And he says, I want you to stay, I'll stay to you, Israel, what you need to do, and I'll stay to you what I'm going to do, God says. And this is God's side of the contract right here, in the midst of all that failure, in the midst of all the golden calf stuff. This is God. This is, this is God's contract with them and with us. He says, this is what you'll say. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. <sighs> okay, I'm feeling more hopeful. <laughs> a God merciful and gracious slow to anger, thank God, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Steadfast love, that's our, that's our great word in the Old Testament, chesed, chesed is this loyal, devoted love. Abounding, not just having some, but abounding in chesed and faithfulness, keeping chesed, keeping steadfast love for thousands, for the greatest and the small. This is the God we're talking about. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Okay, I'm feeling better. <laughs> this, is, this is right after the golden calf. However, there's one more line that kind of sobers me, and it's this. But who will by no means clear the guilty? Now, when he's saying that, he's not talking about those who've been forgiven. He's talking about those who continue to embrace sin as a lifestyle, who continue to embrace life apart from God. God, I don't need you. I don't need your promises. I don't need whatever you've got for me. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do everything my way, and I will be happier without you, God. That's actually sin I just said. That's sin, is the independence from God. People who are in that state, he does not clear that was guilty. Those who are just unrepentant and are embracing sin, who are embracing independence from God. He doesn't just look at them and say, well, I'm a gracious God, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm very broad-minded, and so, yeah, you're doing that stuff. That's okay. No, he doesn't do that. He, he by no means will clear the guilty. However, he has paid the price for the guilty. So the degree to which we come to him confessing our sin, repentant of our sin, and looking to him to be the solution to our sin, and embrace his solution for us in Jesus and the blood of Jesus sprinkled on us. To the degree that we do that, he will be all these things above. Slow to anger, bounding in steadfast love, faithfulness, steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And if you come to him with that attitude about what the sacrifice lamb has done on your behalf, and you embrace that, and you repent, and you commit yourself to him, you're good. But if you die embracing sin as a lifestyle, if you die embracing independence from God, independent rebelliousness from God, there's no way he's just going to wave his hand and say, not a big deal. It will be a big deal. Because our God is a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. You know, in the early church history, especially in the United States, circuit preachers would emphasize hell and damn fire. Damn, damn, fire, hell. I, anyway, that, whatever it is, right? They would emphasize these consequences. And, and we in the modern church look at that and go, well, you know, you're just scaring people into the kingdom. 
So largely the church has lost this emphasis, has lost this sense of the justice of God. But we do, do need to return to it because it's a theme in the Old Testament, very powerful, in the New Testament through Christ. Paul, even in his, in his great arguments that he writes in his letters, talks about the problem of sin. I mean, sin is still a big deal. And with a, with a modern population that will not accept the fact that we are all tragically flawed, then there's no need for a savior. So this is the satanic coup de grace. This is what Satan wants you to do, is he wants you to feel so good about yourself. And that, okay, so you sin a little of the time, but hey, largely you're a very good person, right? He says, and you go, well, yeah, I think I am. Thank you, Satan. You're right, I am. And then you come to him and say, but you know what? You need a savior. Well, from what? I'm doing pretty good. And you see how it doesn't hit? If somehow we don't actually begin our discussions with the bad news, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, there really is no need for a Savior. And Satan knows this. He knows this. So there's something that we need to return to in how we talk with other people, not in a condemning, in a, a put-down kind of manner, but in a, in a, a gentle but firm message that, look, you, you don't want to go down this road. And by the way, God has provided for you a great promise. If you'll, if you'll just accept the fact in repentance of who you are in your sin and come pleading to God, say, God, will you take my sin and pay the price for me? If you do that, then this promise is operative for you. If you don't, there is coming a day where a great shaking will happen. And I'm concerned for you because I don't think you'll survive it. I could tell you lots of stories where I've said this to people. And some people... Some people, when they hear this, they're not scared so much, but they are, they are staggered for a moment. And, and they, I mean, they go one of two ways. You can really see this. They either become very defensive and they start listing all the things they do right, or something that the Holy Spirit does and not you do, something the Holy Spirit says, you need to listen to what he's saying. This is a reality. There is a great shaking coming. You need to, you need to be sober about this. And, and you need to repent for the kingdom of God is near. It starts with repentance. It starts with repentance and embracing the solution from God's perspective. It also is a process, like I said before, the Holy Spirit does in people's hearts. But, but we have to be straight up about sin. And we would rather not offend people. And you, and you do have to do this tactfully. I, I want to say this. You don't want to scare people into the kingdom of heaven. But you really need to, to tell people this is a big deal. It's a big deal everywhere I read it in the New and Old Testament. It's a big deal. I've had people who listen and in ways that I can't actually, I, I can't architect this. I can't design this. All of a sudden, you say something like that about the bad news and something goes ding and they go, okay, wait. Is that true? Yeah, that's yeah, true. And in a way, you can see the Holy Spirit start to work and confirm the truth of that. And I haven't argued them into this. But it has started them thinking through a pathway of looking at their own lives. And if indeed there is a great shaking coming from the creator who made us, if that's really coming, what am I supposed to do? And you see them actually go down in this, almost this despairing decline in your presence. Well, you don't know the things I've done. Yeah, I know, and I'm glad I don't. But I, I know what you're saying. But there is a solution to this problem. There is a solution to this problem. So when God brings him through the, his Holy Spirit, brings him to a point of, of desperation and despair. Many times it won't happen in front of you. It may take weeks, months, or years to get to that point. You get to this point, then when you say to them, hey, there's a solution. There's a solution. They go, tell me, I'm ready. The Holy Spirit does that in people. But they start down this path, if you're just honest about the fact that this is a fact. At the end of the age, before the great city of God, there will be a great shaking. And like at the end of Matthew, there'll be a separation of sheep and goats. It's not a popular thing for us to say because we feel like we're condemning. But you do need to add into that. And if it were not for Christ, that's where I would be going to in the great shaking. If it were not for Christ. And that's why I'm so thankful for what he's done for me. But you need to repent and you need to embrace this solution for you. That's what you need to do. Because God, although he knows the full scope of your sin, still wants you to be part of the city of God. He wants you to be there. Even though he knows everything about you, 
He still loves you. He is the stuff at the top of the screen. But look, if you persist in embracing sin and embracing independence from him, he's not this stuff at the top of the screen. He is a consuming fire because all sin will be eradicated from his universe. You don't want to be hooked to it. So I would just ask you to rethink in a compassionate way how you talk about the bad news before the good news. Because that's what he's saying here. He concluded his entire argument about Hebrews, about Jesus being the sacrificed lamb, by pointing out the fact that in the Old Testament, God made a big deal about sin. Big, big deal. Big, big deal about sin. And in the new covenant through Christ, he has solved the problem of that sin through the sacrifice lamb. So, so God is simultaneously just and loving. We often lose the just part. You need to prayerfully ask God, God, how do I say this to a dying generation of people who, who in their best intentions think they're finding life in the things that they do, and they don't really want to hear what we have to say, but God, how, how do I, how can I be useful in their lives in order to avert a disaster they have no clue is coming? How, how can you use me? The wrong approach is to be condemning. <laughs> you are going to hell. Well, okay, that's true, but that's not really compassionate. But when someone is involved in something that I know is self-destructive, I, I, I get involved and many times in a very gentle way. And if they don't want to hear what I have to say, I back off. But I, I said, you know, I, I, can, I, you know, can I say something? So you, you need God's sensitivity about how to go about doing this. <sighs> or else we'll just turn into holier than thou condemners, and that's not what I want you to be. That, that, was the, that was the era of the early Christian church. I don't want you to be that. But there is a reality of this, which is why, again, in the opening words that come out of the mouth of John the Baptist and the opening words that come out of Jesus himself, the writers of the gospel says they went out there and they said, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. It's at hand. And when you say the kingdom of God is at hand, you mean the judge is knocking on the door. That's what he's saying. The judge is knocking on the door. Don't wait. Don't, don't wait. And God gives us consequences to our sin as a way of training us to the fact that sin indeed is self-destructive. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Okay, I've pressed that quite far enough. <laughs> um, with that in mind, still, still, the writer of Hebrews says, yet once more, God speaking, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And if that doesn't sober you up, nothing will. <laughs> A shaking is coming. A shaking is coming. And the only thing that will remain is the unshakable. And he says, city of God. That promise is unshakable, and that will persist. Well, we're going to sing this song in just a second, and I like this because in the middle of it, the, the lyrics say, I will build my life upon your love. In a sense, you're saying, I won't build my life here. I'll build my life on your love, the promise of what's coming. I'll build my life upon your love. It's a firm foundation. It won't be shaken. I'll put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. You can, put your, you can build a house here and it will be shaken. Or you can place your trust and hope in the promise of God and that will not be shaken. And so that's why I just love this. It changes what you do today if you realize that you're a citizen of that, uh, most truly and most fundamentally, that you're a citizen of that and not a citizen here. And so what he'll do in the, in the last couple verses in Hebrews, which we'll start to look at next week, is chapter 13. <clears throat> He's going to talk about what we call as praxis. Praxis is what you do now. So if indeed that promise is true, and if you're looking forward to that promise, well, darn, what do I do tomorrow? I mean, how does that change how I walk tomorrow? Do, you know, do, am I so heavenly minded I'm, I'm no earthly good? Is that what you want me to do? No, there's, there's practical things. There's praxis things we can talk about. So the last chapter of 13, he's not developing his argument about the promise of the city of God and our involvement in it through the blood of Christ. He's not developing that anymore. He's just saying that now that you know all this stuff, now that you've been staggered and sobered by the fact that God is a consuming fire, now that you know that there's a promise of the city of God coming, he's invited you to it, as well as all the angels and festal gathering, woohoo! Since you know all that stuff, well, how do I live next week? Ah, that's 13. Very practical praxis about how you live. If indeed your hopes and your trust are in that. So how do I do that? That's, that's his great stuff he gives to us. Okay, I got to stop talking. Yeah, we're going to do that. Father in heaven, we thank you indeed for your, your great love that has invited us into your city. 
And it amazes our hearts because you see us in our totality. You understand how warped and twisted we are, even in ways that we keep others from being able to see by bridling our own actions. But boy, if they ever knew, they would probably hate us as friends. And yet, God, you see us clearly. You see us, you see every spot, you see every problem. You see everything that we've done in terms of acquainting ourselves with sin. And yet with all that, you don't, you don't reject us. With all that, as we repent and come before you, and we raise our hands before you and say, God, help me. Help me. I am a worthless sinner. And then you bend close to us and you say, but there's a solution in Jesus. There's a solution in Jesus because I want you in my city. And you invite us to yourself. And then you get out the pen and you open the book and you write our names there. This one's invited. There's a seat with a brass plate on the back with their name on it. They're invited. God, that blows our minds um, that you, through all time and history and geography, somehow you have seen our hearts and drawn us to yourself and your Holy Spirit has welcomed us into your kingdom. And now, Lord, our hearts are continually disconnecting from this place and eager and anticipating the place to come, the city of God. Because, God, we've tried a lot of things here and we understand that here we don't have a city that is lasting. But in your city, we do. It will not be shaken. So, Lord, we build ourselves on the foundation of your love for us and your promises for us fulfilled. So thank you for this great message from your word. And... Uh, and draw us closer to yourself in love. Amen.